Lin Baba, I have a question. Hi. Um, there is a video on YouTube about how GDR started to teach other prisoners meditation after he was recaptured and convicted, I see. And you want to want to know what it was and what was the meditation that they call Indian Mumbo Jumbo? Nice question. Thank you for asking it. Look, um, I will do that meditation. I think a number of people have asked about it. So, okay, I'm going to do that meditation. I, you know, I write music, so I want to write something that's really nice that goes with it, something that's a kind of kind of fluid and gentle, and that takes you into a zone. So I'm writing that, and I'm going to take you through that meditation. I promise you, it's nothing too sophisticated, um, it's nothing too elaborate, um, it's visual and it's experiential in that it takes you into a visual space that you imagine with your eyes closed, and so on. But it did help me and I developed it over some time. So I'm going to share that with you. I'm going to make that, put it together, and we'll bang it out on YouTube. And if anyone gets a benefit, as you said, they might be said it's not to do with books and writing, but it might benefit some people. I agree with you, it might. And enough people have asked about that for me to do it, so I will. I'll put that together, I promise, and we'll put that up on YouTube, and that'll be coming. We'll let you know when that's done. Now, because this is my timer, actually, believe it or not, can I ask you a few questions? Are you still in contact with people from the slum? Yes. Um, and with friends from Mumbai? Yes. If I remember correctly, you were caught in Germany. I was. Why did you start taking so many risks when you knew you were a wanted prisoner? Thank you for your answers, and I hope to see you in person someday. That's very sweet. Thank you. Well, I think what happens to people on the run is that you reach a certain plateau. At first, you're so fearful that you double, triple check everything, and you sleep armed, you double, um, you, the first thing you'll do when you enter any place, you're visiting somebody in an apartment, you will say, hi, can I use the bathroom? And what you're really doing is casing the joint. You're looking for another way out other than the front door that you just came in through. And even if it's down a flight of stairs, out a window, across a balcony, you will look for it and find it. And until you find it, you won't feel comfortable. The first few years are like that. And you are very, very conscious of being hunted and that there is an order on you that you're dangerous and probably armed, which means that it's possible that people would shoot first and ask questions later when they're trying to apprehend you. So you had that hanging over your head. Over years of this, and I've seen this with many other men who've been on the run for, say, 10 years or more, you reach a kind of plateau, and it's a combination of two things. It's where you're starting to get used to it, to being on the run, after, say, four or five years. You're starting to get used to it. But secondly, the fear has mounted in you, because you're fearful every single day and every single night. The fear mounts you to this weird plateau where you start taking crazy risks. I took up skydiving as a sport. I just loved it. And it was very dangerous the way I did it because I'd do several, many jumps in a day, which was too dangerous. So gee, the Aussie accent come in there in a day. So I would do, I do, I did skydiving and so on. I, you know, climbed on very, very tall things, jumped around on buildings, took amazing risks and traveled around the world doing very dangerous, crazy things. You reach a plateau of fear, you get past that and you stop being quite so risky and taking so many risks, you start to measure them out a little more. But what happens is that you start to hit an inevitability curve where after eight years, nine years, ten years on the run, as you get there, you start feeling that it is inevitable that one day you will be caught. This starts to come into your mind. And when you are caught, there is a sense, there's not a sense of, oh my God, it's, all, it's over and it's horrifying. There is a sense within you of serenity. You knew this was coming, if you know what I mean. So that might take you a little bit into that experience of what it was like to be on the run then. So, and why you take risks when you're on the run? What was the actual name you used while on the run in India? Uh, not Lin or Greg, no. Yes, Lin, Lin Baba, Shantaram. Uh, those were the two main names that I was known by. Lin, Lin Baba or Shantaram. I'm still known by those names in Bombay. So another person that says a question, me again. I'm, that's very nice for coming back. I have a question about the many, many mentions of Lin giving away money. It's an interesting question, this. Um, as a gift to the newlyweds, as, uh, to uh, help to people in need, the Georges, for example, to protect Lisa or Carla, or pay fines to the police. He keeps on leaving bundles of money to everyone, everywhere. Why was it so important to demonstrate the depth of his generosity? Interesting. I, of course, didn't... I'm glad you pointed it out, because, see, as a writer, you can think you're really clear in putting something across to people, and then it's not. 
and then someone points that out to you with a question like this, thank you. That wasn't put there to demonstrate his generosity, it was put there to show you when you're on the run, you end up with bundles, and in the life of crime, bundles and bundles of money. And you give it away. You spend it. You, it's crazy. It's a lifestyle in which giving away bundles of money is almost um, your, your salvation. Every gangster I knew who, when they made money on a run, they might be doing a smuggling run, they might be doing a, a big sale, they've ended up with a chunk of money, they would always go down and feed people outside the mosque. Always. They'd feed, they'd go and say, and in Mumbai this is possible to say, I've got this many dollars, I want to feed 250 people. And you can do that because there's going to be a thousand people who need meals. So, and they're that quick in preparing the meals in the restaurants that are associated with mosques in, in Mumbai, for example. So every gangster I knew would do this. I did it too. When I returned from a mission to Mumbai, every street person in the city who was working and living on the street got chicken biryani. We would set it all up right beside Leopold's and you'd have 80, 90 people sitting on the street eating chicken biryani and drinking whatever beverage they wanted and splashing money because you just made it back alive and the money you knew was not clean. It's not clean. When people make clean money through hard work, they hold on to it tight, if you know what I mean. When it's dirty money and you didn't make it through hard work, you made it through crime, trust me, it runs through your fingers. You end up giving it away, giving it away, giving it away. Look to see who the biggest benefactors are in poor communities. It's usually the local gangsters. Okay, there's the answer there. But thanks for pointing that out, because it wasn't trying to make out that he's such a generous person. It's just, firstly, it is his nature to be like that, but the money doesn't mean anything in that lifestyle. Uh, another question, is it Indian people or basic human nature? This is a really nice question. Is it Indian people or basic human nature that helped you in your long adventurous journey from Melbourne to Mumbai? Simply put, you could have traveled to anywhere in the world. You could have gone to Karachi instead, for example, or any other city. Do you think that you would have received the same love, warmth and welcome as you did with Mumbai? Because please give me a reply, Shantaram, and we'd be very happy to hear from you. So I'm very happy to reply. And thank you for the question. I honestly do, of course, look, you could go anywhere in the world and find lovely people, and I have, everywhere I've ever... I've never been to a place and go, oh my God, the people were so horrible. It's not like that. When you go with an open heart, people are nice, and they, they treat me well everywhere I've ever been. So it's not that. Of course you can go anywhere and find warmth and, and succour and help, and people who are just kind to you for no reason, because they just are kind people. You can find that everywhere. The thing about India is that it's deeply connected to a spiritual sense. I really do think, and by the way, the mention of Karachi, um, I was going to put these away, that's my tip. That's me. <laughs> that's my timer telling me I've got to stop soon. All right, just a quick mention on Karachi. I was there in the 1980s. It was, it's a beautiful city. It was so clean, it, it literally blew my mind. You could sit down anywhere in Karachi and have your lunch and so on. It was clean, it was... Um, beautiful and the people were very kind and respectful with me very very nice people everywhere I went so that you mentioned Karachi as it turns out I actually was there and I did have a very nice time there all right so that was in the 80s I'm not sure what it's like now guys 